Uh, it is, uh, what time is it? 20, it's 10, 37 minutes past 10, which means you're watching the press preview, our first look at the front pages as they come in. In the next uh, few minutes, we'll be taking a look at what's making the headlines with the economics correspondent at The Spectator, Kate Andrews, and the editor of The Sheffield Star, Nancy Fielder. Uh, but before that, let's take a look at what's on some of those front pages. Race to get aid to India. The Metro leads with the news that the UK is sending ventilators and oxygen to help the crisis in India. Meanwhile, the government has said a public inquiry into the UK's handling of the coronavirus pandemic is, quote, not appropriate at the moment, adding that the very people who would need to give evidence to an inquiry are working round the clock. That's according to The Guardian. At the front of the star, beat EU to it. This the news that Britain has secured 100 million doses of the French COVID vaccine. The Prime Minister's former chief advisor, Dominic Cummings, has been warned he isn't in the clear over the chatty rat leak, according to The Telegraph. But The Express says that senior Tory MPs want Boris Johnson to rise above it and get on with the job. Uh, the Yorkshire Post reports on the findings of a think tank, which says that the gap between rich and poor is due to widen, as people rely more on inheritance than earnings to get on in life. The FT says that some of Credit Suisse's shareholders are going to try and remove one of the company's board members after recent scandals at the bank. And The Sun features an exclusive interview with Rolling Stone's rock star Ronnie Wood about his battle with cancer during the pandemic. Uh, well, as you can see, I'm joined tonight by Kate Andrews and Nancy Fielder. Ladies, good to see you again. Um, but let us start, um, Nancy, to you first, with the, with the front of the Metro and a story that all of the papers will be covering and in some depth. The absolutely horrendous scenes uh, that we've been seeing here on the channel reported by our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's almost unbelievable. It is. And I mean, as you've said, some of the images we're seeing are just absolutely devastating. I think there is nobody in their right mind who thinks that we shouldn't be sending more aid, that countries like England, Britain, America, France, all countries are in a position to help need to be helping. This is killing people like we've not seen before in India. And actually, as we all know, and as we've said all along, the world is not safe from this pandemic until the whole world is safe. You can't say Britain is safe now, we're all vaccinated. It doesn't work like this. So it's absolutely right that we are helping here. We've, I mean, it's just absolutely devastating scenes. But the wider picture is it's going to keep happening in some of the countries that are a long way away, but they really need our help. And actually, it helps us too to help them. Um, Kate, to you, I mean, just in terms of the story, look, plenty of, you know, people, plenty of people have noticed on social media being vaguely sniffy about the number of ventilators and pieces of equipment that we're sending. Look, every one of them will at some point save a number of lives. So, you know, we, we should bear that in mind. But it's the vaccine. It's the vaccine that India needs to get. And, and I just wonder whether, whether you agree with the argument by Bill Gates and uh, Nancy just made it there that, look, you know, we should not be vaccinating 30 to 40-year-olds at a time when... India is seeing, you know, hundreds of thousands of new cases every day. Does that argument make sense? Well, I think it does make sense, but it's a difficult one to make politically. Mm. It's it, There's already a precedent, actually, for shipping some vaccines abroad. The UK, um, several weeks ago, shipped hundreds of thousands of vaccines. It turned out to Australia when the EU was uh, making it very difficult to export vaccines. The UK stepped in to get uh, those vaccines to uh, our ally in Australia. Um, but they kept it very quiet. They didn't want this to be a news story of generosity, um, of, of the UK coming to the rescue, because they knew it was very politically difficult to be shipping off vaccines that are here domestically to another country. Now, I think you can make a very strong moral case uh, that we should be shipping not just the 600 pieces of medical devices, the ventilators, which will no doubt help some people, but also vaccines as well to India to get the most vulnerable inoculated and to save lives. The difficulty is that the Prime Minister has laid out a roadmap that is very long. It's the longest it's taken to come out of a lockdown so far, and that he says is dependent on the data staying extremely low, and that includes getting more and more people jabbed. 
Now, it's very hard to ask your public to continue to put off not just major life events, but normal daily events when you're shipping vaccines abroad. So I think part of the political strategy to come out of lockdown is making it harder to probably do the more ethical and right thing, which is to get the vaccines to the people who really need it most, to the people who are much more likely to be hospitalized and sadly die from this virus. I mean, Nancy, as we, we take a look at the, the, the front of the Financial Times, their, their headline, they're overwhelmed India at COVID breaking point. And we, we are not even at the peak uh, of infections in, in India at the moment. That, that appears to be, you know, some, some distance away. But isn't, it, isn't the historical relationship between the United Kingdom and India enough of a reason to do that which the Indians are calling out for, Bill Gates is calling out for? I mean, Boris Johnson, I keep hearing, is, you know, is a, a fantastic communicator. If anyone could sell sending vaccines to India, surely it's him. Well, you're right. I mean, historically, there is quite a weight on our shoulders to help quite a few countries, to be honest. But actually, that shouldn't matter, should it? We're talking here about, are we opening pubs and going inside? Are we going to festivals? Which is fantastic. We all want to boost our economy. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people dying. And the question is, what would we want them to do if we were in their situation? And we all know the answer. But that isn't easy to communicate. I'm not sure it's the public. I think a lot of us actually think that this is the right thing to do and we should be doing more than we're doing. But there are certain elements, and I'm sure there are lots of them within government, who fear that they would lose votes if they did what everybody can see is morally the correct thing to do. Um, Kate, we can't, we can't let a, a press preview go past without a bit of palace intrigue. Let's have a look at the front of the Daily Telegraph. And the, the Dominic Cummings story continues um, to rumble on. I mean, it's, it's some time before he appears in front of the Select Committee. Uh, but the story in the Telegraph is an interesting one. Tell us about it. Uh, so this is a continuation of the story that has been exploding in Westminster over the weekend, um, in which Number 10 suggested that Dominic Cummings was responsible uh, for, for certain leaks that had taken place last year and also potentially around some text messages sent uh, to Boris Johnson from Sir James Dyson over a tax break as he was going about trying to create life-saving equipment at the height of the pandemic last year. Um, unsurprisingly, Dominic Cummings pushed back. He published a very long blog, um, which raised big question marks and really dropped bombs uh, on the prime minister and the government around the refurbishing of his flat, around the leak inquiries and what Cummings says, uh, and number 10, um, I'm sure, uh, would actively deny, was a, was a desire to suppress uh, one of the leak inquiries because it might be tied to the prime minister's fiance's good friend, um, and other just really explosive claims. Um, now, today on The Telegraph, we have number 10 pushing back again, saying that Dominic Cummings is not cleared yet. Um, and we're going to see uh, this battle play out. But a lot of the questions around certain leaks that took place last year uh, died down a bit. Now they're really back on the political scene. And as you mentioned, Dominic Cummings is set uh, to sit in an inquiry on the government's handling of the pandemic uh, later on in May. And in this blog, he is very critical of the prime minister's handling the pandemic not just about the leaks, it's about the overall sense of what was happening in Downing Street at the time, decisions that he's now saying he very clearly disagreed with. Um, so the concern, of course, in number 10 is, you know, on, on the better side, this could be slightly humiliating that one of his top advisors is, is pushing back in such a way. But of course, if any of the allegations that Dominic Cummings set out ended up being true, mm. the prime minister could be in significantly hot, well, hotter water uh, than he would otherwise be, um, not just with the public, but also with his own party and the way that he's been handling the pandemic and other aspects of his time in Downing Street. I mean, it's still, Nancy, the, the, the headline in the Express, uh, for Britain's sake, get on with the job. I mean, the, there are certainly plenty of people who are of that opinion. It just seems to me it's slightly difficult for, 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 for the Daily Express and for others to suggest that Boris Johnson needs to rise above all of this, given the allegation that the Prime Minister it phoned, personally phoned, the editors of three separate national newspapers to brief them on the story. Absolutely. I think every one of us agrees, in part, with this headline, get on with the job. But actually, we don't want them to get on with the job with all these scandals, with all this corruption. It's like some sort of hideous soap opera where you're just wondering what's going to pop up next. These are the people who are supposed to be running their country. They're doing it in our name. We've elected them as a country, and actually, they should just be doing much better. They, this is why politics has got such an awful name. This is why one in three of us can be bothered to vote in the local elections coming up and the rest of us can't because everybody is sick to, sick to death of these kind of vows and allegations. And it's not about getting on with sol solving, solving the COVID issue. 
solely. It's about cleaning up the act and actually making us think that our politicians are doing things on our behalf rather than these kind of scandals that just go on and on. Uh, Nancy, Kate, we will pause there just to take a very quick break. Uh, but coming up after it, an Oscar ceremony unlike any before. Uh, that will be coming your way after this. Welcome back to the press preview. Kate and Nancy still with us. And uh, Kate, to you first. Take us inside the Metro, their page two article about, about scam ads online. Thankfully, I've, I've not fallen foul to any of those, but I know a fair few people who have. Yes, so throughout the pandemic, scams online and related to one's mobile phone or landline phone um, have risen significantly as people have been sitting at home on their computers um, with their phones being their access to the outside world during lockdowns. And um, this article in particular is looking at some of those tech giants and the role that they have played um, in, in this article. It's saying not doing a good enough job um, in, in tackling some of those scam ads. So it's singling out Facebook and Google uh, and saying that the consumer group, which found that 30 Four percent of victims who reported an ad to Google said it wasn't taken down, and about a quarter of people who did so for Facebook said uh, the same. Um, and I think this is an interesting story because if it hadn't been for the pandemic, focus on the tech giants would have actually been um, much more intense. It was a policy area with the online harms and the safety bill uh, that the government was really looking at. So you can see how this might have come up anyway in 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 one of those um, in one of those ways. Uh, but the fact that the pandemic has meant that scamming has moved on online means that it's a more pertinent issue um, for this area specifically. Uh, and no doubt, as the pandemic hopefully soon winds down as the vaccine factor so far, all the data suggests that it's um, it's going like gangbusters, hopefully means that we'll be able to tackle some of these issues, but also remove people from these situations where they might be more prone to scams. I mean, Nancy, are you in any way surprised by this? Because I have to say, I'm not. I mean, at the point at which Facebook, Google, you know, are, are threatened, they'll have their bottom line threatened, uh, you know, if they don't act and all of this, then perhaps you'll see some action until that point. It's difficult to see why they would. Well, absolutely. And the same sort of restrictions, the same sort of action that will be taken against you at Sky News or was it a newspaper if we mm. publish things that weren't true and even worse than that, that were deliberately targeting people. I mean, these are internet sites of massive reach and massive influence and they should be regulated much more strictly. What's really depressing about some of the detail of this article is people just don't think they'll take action. So a lot of the time they just don't even bother to report it. It's like kind of they're happy putting up with it, but they're so powerful and so influential why shouldn't they be regulated so that we can all be kept a little bit safer? Yeah, don't hold your breath. Uh, guys, let's have a quick look, though, at the front page of The Sun. Um, not the story, of course, the really sad story, in fact, about, about Ronnie Wood, but the, the story about the Oscars. Of course, my, my invite to the Van, uh, Vanity Fair party clearly got lost in the post this year. It, I mean, is, th is there any point to having the Oscars without the red carpet, without all the glitz, the glamour, the champagne and the silliness? Uh, what do you think, Kate? I think it's important for the industry, which has taken such a beating during the year of COVID uh, because people just haven't been able to go to the cinemas. And even when they have last year, when we didn't have vaccines, it was something that people were loath to do because of the safety concerns. Uh, so it's been a really difficult year. I think it's a, a nice opportunity to celebrate the art and the film that has still been made. Um, I think I'm right in saying that Britain has one of the largest numbers of nominations in nearly 20 years at the Oscars. So it's an exciting <laughs> one to look on. Certainly looking different this year with um, almost hubs created in different parts of the world, including LA and here in London on the South Bank, so that people haven't had to travel, although they have wanted yeah. guests to show up in yeah. Britain because it's very difficult at the Golden Globes with it all on Zoom. Kate, so sorry to have interrupted you there, but we are entirely out of time. 